Well, Travis was a, uh, a Las Vegas pimp uh, when I first met him. He was kind of new to the, the career, uh, but he had gotten a bunch of girls to work for him really quick. Uh, Warren was a hardcore atheist. He hated uh, even the idea of God or anyone who believed in God. His job uh, was he, he is a fire-breathing, evil clown in a Las Vegas horror show. And so he just, uh, he intimidates and scares people for a living. Here's how I met Warren. Uh, he heard about this new church that was starting in his city, Las Vegas, and he got this idea that he could kill the church. He thought it's a new church, there won't be that many people, that the people won't be that committed to it. And so his plan was to show up, to sit in the middle of the room, and in the middle of the service, when the guy gets up to, to preach, when the preacher goes up there, to stand up and just start cursing, maybe throw some punches, to, to make it bad enough and disgusting enough that everyone's like, I'm not going back. It's a pretty good plan. The only problem was, I was the preacher. <laughs> Man, guys, I am so excited to be here. I can't even tell you how grateful I am for this church, and it's so cool to finally uh, be with you. As uh, they said earlier, my name is Vince Antonucci, and you may know that I am the pastor of Verb Church in Las Vegas. Uh, you may not know that I am like one of the last people you'd ever imagine uh, would be a pastor. Uh, my mother is Jewish. My father was a professional poker player in Las Vegas. They took me to church never, uh, never. I, I never went to church my whole life growing up. Uh, I uh, never had anyone invite me, never had anyone mention Jesus. And, and so growing up, I knew nothing about God or Jesus or Christianity. Uh, when I was 20 years old, it was the, the Easter morning of my sophomore year in college, and I was waiting for my girlfriend uh, in my dorm room. She was late as usual, and so I turned on the TV. We only had three channels uh, in our dorm room, and every channel had on uh, what I consider to be a dumb religious show. And I, I would have just turned the TV off, but the last channel I hit looked uh, potentially comical. It was this really old man, like old, and he was sitting like this in this big red leather overstuffed chair. He was just kind of like sunk down in it, and I was like, what is this guy? And so I left it on for a second, and he started talking. I'll never forget what he said. Um, he said, now, we've been discussing the last week of Jesus Christ's life, and today we're going to talk about, and then he named something from Jesus' life that I don't remember, went right over my head. And then he said, now, most scholars believe that this event happened on the Tuesday of Jesus last week. But today, I am going to prove to you through the evidence that it actually occurred on the Wednesday of Jesus last week. That is the first thing I ever heard about Jesus in my entire life. And I thought about it for a minute, and I'm like, yeah, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I mean, I, I admit, I don't know anything about Jesus, but like Tuesday, Wednesday, it, I, I turned off the TV in disgust, knocked on the door, went out to brunch with my girlfriend. But for the rest of the day, I could not stop thinking about that guy. I, I just had all these questions like, um, like what, what kind of evidence would there be for something that happened so long ago? And, and why did he care if it was Tuesday or Wednesday? And did anyone ever get him out of that chair? Like, just all these questions. And, and so uh, that, that night, I borrowed a Bible from my girlfriend. It was sitting on her shelf. Literally, the wrapper was still on it. She had never opened it. Someone had given it to her. And I had never touched a Bible. But, but I brought it back to my dorm room, and I opened it up, not knowing anything about it, but expecting that it would be set up like the TV guide by day and time because of the whole Tuesday-Wednesday debate that was apparently tearing up Christianity and, uh, and so I opened it. It was a student Bible. I don't know if you've ever seen these, but uh, they're designed to help teenagers get into the Bible. And so when you open it, instead of Genesis 1-1, it says reading plans. First thing I saw. And, and so I start flipping through. It says reading plan through Abraham's life. I'm like, Lincoln? I, I, I don't know. Uh, reading plan through Moses' life. I'm flipping through. And then I see reading plan through Jesus' life. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll do that one. I mean, let's figure this out. Was it Tuesday or Wednesday? Like, Let's settle this. Let's do this. 
And so I start reading the Bible for the first time. I expected to read like a fable. You know, I, I thought it would start out once upon a time. There lived a man named Jesus who did nice things for people and did miracles and had a blue ox named Babe and could lasso tornadoes. And I would, you know, roll my eyes and, and chuck the Bible. And, uh, and so I was so very surprised uh, when I realized that over and over the Bible gives time and place. Over and over the Bible said, at this time, in this place, Jesus did this thing. And at this time in this town where this guy was the, the governor and this guy was the teacher, Jesus did this thing. And, and I realized, man, if you give time and place, there, there would be evidence. But like you could look up, there would be other historians from the time. You, you could find out if this really happened. So now I'm intrigued. And I just keep reading. And, uh, and, and I realized um, for the first time uh, that the Bible claimed that there was a God uh, who loved me. And who had sent Jesus uh, to live and to die for me. To, to uh, invite me into relationship with God and to go to heaven forever. I had never heard any of that. And, and I knew that I had to know. And I knew I could figure out if it was true or not because time and place. And, and so I, I decided, man, I, I'm going to figure it out. And if it's true, I'll become a Christian. And if it's not true, I will spend the rest of my life making fun of Christians who are believing in something that I can prove is false. And so I spent the next month, four, I was a pre-law major. I, I did end up going to law school. Um, and so I was into that kind of thing. And I spent months studying the evidence, hoping to disprove Christianity. Uh, but the, the evidence is overwhelming. It's, it's just overwhelming. And eventually, uh, I, had, I just had no room left for doubt. I, I knew it was true. But what was even more overwhelming to me uh, was, was God's heart for me. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. But, like, I mean, the, the idea that God loved me and that he had sent Jesus for me. That, that Jesus came to earth and his mission was to pursue me. I couldn't understand it. I, I sat in my dorm room. Uh, one day I'm, I'm reading, you know, this reading plan, right? And I read uh, the story Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 4. Jesus says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and, and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Man, I read that, I was so fascinated. So, so uh, the shepherd who has a hundred sheep, I'm like, a hundred's a lot of sheep, I think, right? It's a, a, a lot of anything. Like, is there anything you have a hundred of? A hundred's a lot of something. I, I realize I, I have a hundred books, at least a hundred books. And if I lost one of my books, I would never even, I'd never even know, Right? Um, how about this? Any, any parents in here? People have kids? Uh, what if you had a hundred kids? Do you think you'd ever notice if one of them just kind of wandered away? So, so my parents, when I, when I was young, had two kids, me and my younger sister, Lisa. And one time, it was a true story, I was, I think, six years old maybe. My sister was four. Our parents took us out to dinner um, at Arthur Treacher's Fish and Chips. Anyone remember? Yeah? Um, yeah. There's a support group for us, so I'll talk to you later. Um, so they take us out. Uh, after dinner, they put us in the, the back of the car. My dad starts the car, pops in the eight-track tape. Some of us know. Some of us ask questions later. Uh, knowing my parents, mid-70s. So it was probably like Neil Diamond's greatest hit. So music comes on. Hands. Touching hands. Reaching out. Touching you. Touching me, sweet Caroline. Not bad, not bad. I'm impressed. Okay, I'm impressed. Um, so, true story. My dad shifts into to drive and starts pulling out of the parking lot. They didn't realize that they hadn't shut my sister's door really well. And she was leaning against it. The door swung open. She fell out of the car. The door quietly swung shut. And I didn't say a word. <laughs> I just... We... We drive down the road. We're driving down the road, and my dad goes, where's Lisa? And I'm like, man, he was so mad. 
<laughs> he spins the car around. We go back. Lisa's laying there in the parking lot crying. My parents had two kids, and they didn't notice right away that one of us was missing in a car. <laughs> The shepherd has a hundred sheep, but he immediately, he notices that one is missing. And I'm sitting there reading the story, and I'm like, one sheep can't be hard to replace, right? Like, it's not a big deal. You wait till spring, you got a bunch of little baby sheep. Now you got 120 sheep, right? You're good. It's no big deal. But not in Jesus' story, right? Not in the mind of this shepherd. And the reason... I, I came to understand this because Jesus wasn't telling a story about a, a shepherd and, and his sheep. Jesus' story was this, this parable, this metaphor, and, and to, to tell the story of, of God and people. And, and in the story, the shepherd represents God, and the sheep was me. I couldn't understand it. So, so I mean, that, that's why a, a lost sheep can't be replaced. So, so I, I now have two kids of my own. And um, if one of my two kids wandered off, I would not say to my wife, eh, we could make another one, right? It's not when it's your kid. And, and I'm realizing, oh, we're God's kids. So, so we actually had this happen once. Um, we, we took our kids, I think they were like five and three, to uh, Water Country, USA, up in Virginia Beach area. And um, it's a big water park, and our kids are little, so we can't do the good stuff. We have to do the, the kiddie stuff. And so we go to this kiddie pool, about half the size of this room, and it's got all this fun stuff for the kids to play in. And then we walk about 50 yards to the next kiddie pool, and this one had this big yellow slide about maybe 10 feet high. And yet the kids had to climb a rope ladder, get to the top, and then slide down. My kids loved it. They went up, down, up down, up, down. And finally, my wife, we're just standing watching. My wife says, hey, I'm going to go stand under that mushroom shower umbrella thingy. And I was like, all right. So she walks over there. My son goes up, down, and says, where's mom? Where's mom? And I said, oh, she went under the mushroom shower umbrella thingy. And he said, can I go get her? I'm like, yeah, go ahead. So he runs off, and my daughter proceeds to go up, down, up, down, up, down, about 15 thousand times like she will not stop finally I'm like all right let's go get mom and Dawson and so we walk over and my wife is standing under the mushroom shower umbrella thingy and I don't see my son Dawson I'm like hey where's where's Dawson she said he's with you I said no I, I sent him over here uh, like five minutes ago and she said I haven't seen him uh, I don't, maybe I'm dumb, but my first instinct was to freak out. Like, I'm like, oh, man, I've seen this on TV, the, a, a water park, a kiddie pool is a perfect place to abduct a kid. And I'm like, just stop, stop, he's here. He got distracted. There's a lot of fun stuff to, to play in. And, and so I start looking around the pool, and uh, he is not in it. And I'm like, no, he's got to be here somewhere. And there's a lot of kids. I'm just missing him, but he is not there. I'm like, no, 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 stop. Um, he's wearing a blue bathing suit. Look for blue bathing suit. Um, he's got light brown hair, light brown hair, light brown. Nope. I'm like, maybe he's in the slide. Nope, he is not there. And it's been, I don't know, it's been seven or eight minutes now. And I, I just start, like, freaking out. And so I, um, I ran out of the pool, and I got up on the, like, the sidewalk where you could look down on the pool. Because I thought maybe from there I could see him. And, and so I'm looking down, and... Um, I don't see him, and I'm like, don't freak out, Vince, he's here. And, and I'm like, blue bathing suit, light brown hair, uh, he's in one of the slides. Man, my, my heart starts racing, my throat clenches up, my head is pounding. He's not in the pool. I start looking down the sidewalk and up the sidewalk and down the sidewalk. And, and I look back up the sidewalk, and I thought I saw this kid kind of weaving between people's legs. And I thought maybe blue bathing suit and maybe light brown hair. I wasn't sure, but I wasn't taking any chances. And so I literally, it's embarrassing, but I just started yelling. I'm like, Dawson! 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 And finally this kid hears me, and, and he kind of does one of these. And, and I saw that it was him, and he saw me, and he starts running to me through all the people, and I'm running to him. It probably was quite romantic if you could watch us run, running to each other. And, and finally he gets to me, and he... Um, he just like dives in my arms and he starts crying. And I said, where were you, buddy? Where were you? And he said, I went to the other pool, the first pool, and I can't find mommy. She's not there. And, and I said, oh, no, I'm so sorry. She's not in that pool. She's still in this pool. And he said, oh, and, and he's crying. And I held him. And I held him. And I realized in that moment that I understood what it's like to be God. Right? I mean, 
the, the way I felt about my son, somehow it's the way that God felt about me. The, the way I felt about my son is the way God feels about you. It, it's the way God feels about all your, your friends and neighbors and, and family members who have wandered away from him. I, I think of... Uh, what I might vote for as the most powerful passage in the Bible, I don't know, Jeremiah chapter 4, um, where God says, Oh, my anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart, my heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent. You read that, you're like, whoa, God, God doesn't usually talk like that. What's he talking about? He says, my people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. And, and then God says, if you'll return, O Israel, return to me. Man, I, I'm, I'm reading all this and I just can't understand it. Because the, the truth about me um, is that I am, I, I am a wretch. I am sinful I am a mess, but God loved me, and he pursued me, and he invited me to return to him, and I said, yes. <laughs> I said, yes, and I don't know you. I've met virtually none of you, um, but I suspect that you're a wretch. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, I, I know you probably drive a pretty nice car and you probably have a, a nice home and a well-manicured lawn, uh, but, but the part of you that you don't show anyone is that you're a sinful mess and God loves you and he pursued you and he invites you to return to him. And I know probably most of you have said yes. And if you haven't, then God still loves you. He's still pursuing you. And he's still waiting for you to say yes and come home to him. Man, when you, when you know that God loves you like that, you, like, I just think you have to say yes. Like, how do you say no to a love like that? But, but then what do you do? You share it, right? You, you, you share God's love. You share Jesus, which is what Jesus told us to do, right? He said, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And what, what an amazing honor that is that we actually get to share Jesus with people. And we don't deserve that. Like, we, I, don't get, I don't deserve to get to talk about Jesus, but God has given us this honor. Um, the, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We get to help people come home to, to God. Uh, Jesus gave us his mission. So he said in John 20, verse 21, he said, As the Father has sent me... I am sending you. Wow. He, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So, so he, Jesus, was sent to pursue God's senseless children who had wandered off. And now we are sent. You are sent to pursue God's senseless children who have wandered off. And so I came from Las Vegas to ask you this question. Who are you pursuing? Who are you pursuing? Because, I mean, like your, your coworker, she, she's just your, your coworker. But when God looks at her, it's like blue bathing suit, light brown hair. Maybe she's in one of those slides, right? The, the guy who lives next door to you, is just, he's just your neighbor. But when God looks at him, man, his heart starts racing and his throat clenches up and his head is pounding. When God thinks about your relative who is not a follower of Jesus, oh, my anguish, my anguish. Who are you pursuing? Who are you pursuing? Jesus has given us his message and his mission, and we are sent, and we need to go. We need to go. Can I, can I give you a suggestion? Um, as you go, in your pursuit of this person who God has put in your life, like that's why you live where you live. 
but because God's got someone in your cul-de-sac who he wants you to reach for Jesus. That's, I am convinced, that's why you have the job you have. It's not because, well, I need an income. No, it's because there's someone there who needs Jesus. So as you go and as you pursue that person, my suggestion is lead with love. Lead with love. Uh, the, The Bible says that Christ's love compels us. The reason we go, the reason we pursue people is because we know Christ's love. And so we can't help but share it with others, right? Christ's love compels us to pursue them, to share. And when we do, as we go, we need to lead with love. Meaning, don't start with truth, okay? That person needs truth and they need love. Don't start with truth. Meaning, don't start out by telling them what's wrong with their life. Meaning, don't start out by telling them you're lost and is that true? That's true. Don't start that way, okay? In your, uh, in your conversations, on your social media, don't start that way. Lead with love, which is what Jesus did, right? Whenever he met someone who was, um, like, stuck in sin, he always led with love. If you study the life of Jesus, like I did in the dorm room, Like maybe the the most remarkable thing about him is that he is the one sinless person who ever walked the face of the planet. But everywhere he went, the most sinful people wanted to be around him. That's weird, right? I'm I'm reading that going, it doesn't usually work that way. Sinful people are usually like, I don't want to be around that guy. He's he's sinless. But that wasn't the way it was, right? We see prostitutes pouring perfume on Jesus' feet. Jesus would go to a party and all the sinners would gather around him. Uh, We see Jesus hanging out with a woman who had gone from bed to bed to bed, from man to man to man. Why? Why did all these sinful people want to be around Jesus? I think it's because Jesus didn't make them feel worse. He, he, they already felt bad about themselves. They know, right? People know. He, he didn't make them feel worse about themselves. No one wants to be around someone who makes them feel worse. You don't want to be around someone who makes you feel worse. Jesus didn't make them feel worse. He made them feel loved. He made them feel loved. Jesus knew a, a secret that somewhere I think Christians seem to have lost. It's love that turns a life around. The, the, the way to, ch- to turn a person's life, to, to change their life, is not by judging them, but by embracing them. Not, not by pointing out their sins, but by pointing them to the one who loves them despite their sins. People need truth, okay? They need truth. And people need love. But we should follow Jesus' example and lead with love. Because it's love that builds a relationship. It's love that opens a person's ears to what you have to say. It's love that opens their heart to the message. And it's love that leads that person to repentance. Not fear of God's wrath. Not fear of what might happen. Nope, it's love. Uh, That's what the Bible teaches us. For instance, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, for the grace of God. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Okay, that's how we get saved is through God's grace. And then it says it. What's it? The grace of God. Still the same subject, right? My mom uh, was an English teacher, right? I'm like, yep, that's the same subject. For the grace of God has appeared to offer salvation to all people. It, the grace of God, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. It says that, that it's the offer of God's grace, not the threat of his wrath, that leads people both to salvation and to repentance. That's why Jesus led with love. Now, I want to make sure you hear me right. Don't be afraid to share the truth, right? We're going to share the truth. We, we have to do that. But we lead with love. And it is, it is so powerful for someone who doesn't know God loves them to hear that God loves them. And I, I can tell you, sitting in that dorm room reading the Bible, it's, it, it is so powerful to hear that God loves you. So you remember Travis, the, the, the pimp? Um, he is the first person I led to Christ in Las Vegas, uh, the first person we baptized at our church. Um, he, he heard me uh, share the story of the prodigal son, and, I mean, he really listened. He really heard it, and it wrecked him. 
um, he's, he's literally is bawling, and he kept saying, I just didn't know I could be loved like that. I just didn't know I could be loved like that. Uh, that was 13 years ago, and about six years ago, Travis was ordained as a pastor, and this past November moved to Denver to start a new church there. And it, it is... It is so powerful to hear that God loves you. See, you remember Warren, the angry atheist, and he was going to come, and he was going to sit in the middle, in the middle you know, of the service. He was going to get up and curse and hit people. And the, the sermon he came uh, to, the day that he came to destroy the church, was from Ephesians chapter 2, just was the sermon that day. And it's about how we're dead in sin. It's, uh, it was Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5 was the main teaching. It says, but because... Of his great love for us. Because of his great love for us. God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So the the service. 60 minutes whatever later. Ends. And and we're like see you next week. And Warren goes. Oh I forgot to do my thing. It, it turns out Warren sitting in the middle we got so engrossed in the service, he forgot to disrupt it. And, and so Warren came back the following week, and the following week, and the following week. And, and eventually, a few weeks later, I got to meet Warren and kind of hear his story. And, and then I realized that Warren started coming to all three of our identical church services every week. And I went up to him in the lobby, and I was like, hey, um, you do... <laughs> You do realize they're all the same, right? Like you're, you're seeing that? And uh, quote, word for word quote, he said, yeah, um, I, uh, no, I, I just, I can't get enough of Jesus. And, um, and it was not uh, much, a uh, couple months later that he said yes to following Jesus. And before Warren got baptized, um, it, was, <laughs> it was a wild moment. He, uh, he looked out at everyone and he pointed down to the water and he said, I have a confession to make. I didn't come here for this. I came here because I knew I was stronger than you and I thought I could ruin you. But something has happened to me here. And he is a big intimidating guy. Um, you can look up Scorch the Clown. Google him, you'll see what he looks like. Scorch the Clown. And this big dude starts crying, and he says, something has happened to me here, and I can't explain it, but I've learned that God loves me, and I just want his love. And it is so powerful to hear that God loves you. We have hundreds of stories, like Travis's and Warren's. And and listen, through your financial support here of this church, Uh, and your prayers for us, you are a part of every one of those stories. And how cool of a church do you go to that when you give here, it's not just impacting your area, but some of it is going to impact lives and and create those stories in Las Vegas. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And and you have an opportunity, you heard earlier, to come out and hang out with us for a few days. I think it's going to be in December and do a mission trip, and we will have fun, and you will help us get to make more of those stories. Um, I hope you'll come. But even more than that, I want you to have those stories. And and I don't mean you as a church. Yes, you as a church. But I mean you personally in in your life. And it it obviously doesn't have to be a pimp or an atheist. It it might be your coworker or your neighbor or the barista at the coffee shop you hang out at or, or your classmate at school. Who are you pursuing? Who are you pursuing? Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Are you living out that mission that he gave you? Do you have God's heart for his children who have wandered away from him? Let's pray for that, and then let's go pursue them like Jesus pursued us. And uh, after I pray, we're going to continue in worship. Let's pray.